All right, let's do this. Hey, robot fans, welcome back to the build. Summer has finally cooled off, so today we are going to start with the armor. We're gonna start with all of the arm parts because you can't spell armor without arm. Huh? That's clever. It's fun. We're having fun. Moving on. So here are all the arm parts we're going to be dealing with today. To start, we need to do some major trimming of these vac-formed ABS parts. My kit is from Kevin Weir over at imperialsurplus.com. He is the best of the best. On his site and his YouTube are some great instructions on how to put together your kit. He has a page showing you how to draw all the cut lines for each of these vac form pieces, so I followed that as a main guide. I drew out all of the lines on the arm pieces and began trimming. Most of this trimming was done with a Dremel. You will notice the outdoor setting here and the mask I'm wearing. These kits are made from ABS plastic and ABS dust is some really nasty toxic stuff. Do not sand or Dremel this stuff indoors, your lungs will thank you, I promise. For a couple of the smaller parts, I did the trimming with a small pair of snippers indoors in order to obtain a cache of these perfectly uniform ABS chips. These will come in handy later in the build. After the initial trimming, I did a cursory sanding of all of the really rough edges with a belt sander, just getting rid of the super jaggies left by my trimmers and the dremeling. From here on out, each of these pieces is going to require its own unique attention, so let's start at the top with the shoulders. The shoulders don't require any assembly, so after getting rid of the rough edges, it's just a matter of smoothing them out with some hand sanding. I know a lot of people tend to go pretty crazy with sanding, going all the way up to 800 or 1000 grit and wet sanding. I've never found that necessary for anything. Maybe if you're doing a totally clean and polished TK, but for a weathered clone, I personally see no reason to go that high. Here's my main method that I will be using for every piece of the build. Cursory sanding at 150 grit to round edges and remove high spots, and then a secondary sanding at 220 grit to smooth it out a little bit. Next, I prime it with Rust-Oleum 2-in-1 primer, then I do a light sand with a 320 grit sandpaper. I add Bondo glazing putty to any visible low spots, and then I do a full sand with 320. I repeat this middle step as many times as needed until it's perfect, then I do a final sand at 400 grit. At that point, I'm ready to apply my white paint. For this, I'm using Krylon Fusion for Plastics White. The key to painting plastic parts is light, light coats. You shouldn't get any significant cover from any single coat. Gently add layers until it's completely covered. Do a light 400 grit sanding of that and then do some more layers if necessary. There is no set amount of painting sanding iterations. It's done when it's done. I like to wait for my white base coats to fully cure before I do any color and masking on top of it so these parts will sit in a cool dry place for a week per the instructions on the back of the can. After waiting my week we're going to add on the 501st blue. The whole shoulder bell is blue but before we can paint that we have to mask off some random paint chips and scratches to accentuate the weathering we will be doing. To do this I use liquid latex painted with a dry paintbrush to literally paint on the scratches and chips. When that's dry we can spray a few coats of our blue right on top. For this I'm using Krylon Global Blue Paint for plastics. Next comes my favorite part, peeling the latex. I use a little pick in my thumb to peel it away like a clone sunburn. It's so oddly satisfying it's not even funny, like a whole roll of bubble wrap all to yourself. I love it. This leaves us with some nice looking yet oddly clean scratches and dings. To dirty them up and make them look a little more natural, we are going to do our darker weathering. This is a combination of hand painting, dry brushing, and washes all done with a black acrylic paint. The goal here is to leave nothing totally white and to add in some scuffs and blaster marks. I finish this all off with an airbrush to accentuate the dark spots. I go into more detail on this whole process in my helmet weathering video which you can see here. When I'm done with the weathering, I hit the whole thing with a Krylon matte clear coat to seal it in and finish off these shoulders. So up until this point in the build, I've had a pretty good handle on how to do everything. I've definitely looked at a lot of build logs and asked a lot of questions, but for the most part, I feel like I had a pretty good idea of what I was gonna do and how I was gonna move forward. Now we're getting into the assembly of all these parts and I am completely lost. I remember looking at that big pile of KW armor when it first came and having no idea how these things go together or how they're gonna stay on my body once they are together. So I've reached out to a lot of people, I've asked a ton of questions, but one person who I've asked more questions to than anyone else is uh, Commander Gats. Gats is super experienced at all this stuff. He has given me so much help through everything. 95% of what you're gonna see from here on out in this build comes directly from him and all of his build experience. So I was actually gonna go back and look at how many questions I asked him just for this arms portion of the build, but that got really embarrassing really quickly. Let's just say it was a lot of questions, <laughs> way too many questions, and he's been nothing but gracious and awesome. So I just wanna say a huge thank you to Gats for all the help, and let's get back to the build. Okay, now we're gonna set up some padding on the inside of the shoulder 
Uh, these are all the parts that are going to be used. First up, we have this knee pad here. I'll put a link to this product in the description of the video. We have a four pronged end piece of an EVA foam pad. You know, if you buy like those floor mats, they have these. These are like the end pieces that make a straight edge. He's going to cut off a piece of that. I have the carpet side of a piece of industrial Velcro. I have a little piece of plastic here. I 3D printed this, but you can use any piece of plastic you want. It's about five millimeters thick. And there's going to be a snap. Uh, there's going to be a lot of snaps in this build. So one thing I did is I bought a pack of snaps that have a pre-attached screw. So I can screw one end of the snap into something hard. In this case, it's going to be this piece of plastic. And to hold everything down, we have the Bob Smith Industries purple stuff and some Elmer's rubber cement. So first up, we have our little plastic piece. Um, I'm going to screw in this button end here. Obviously, the screw is a little bit long, so I'm going to cut off the end here and then screw it and glue it. That's a good uh, bumper sticker. Screw it and glue it into this plastic piece, and then this is going to be super glued onto the inside rim of the shoulder here. It's going to be totally centered so that the button is facing down. This will eventually snap onto the strap that goes from the chest piece to the back piece, but for now this can just hang out on the top. Now we're going to attach this foam piece to run along the bottom edge of the shoulder here. And what this is going to do is going to give some padding up against the outside of the upper arm piece so that this doesn't scrape on the paint and take away all your weathering. To attach this, I'm going to use rubber cement and then I'm going to secure it with a couple drops of super glue once it's all set. Next up, we have the Velcro strip. This is a two inch piece of self adhesive Velcro strip. I cut it in half making two one inch strips that I will cut into a Y shape. The arms of the Y should meet up nicely with the edges of this EVA foam piece. It's a self adhesive strip, but I also put down a little bit of glue along the edges to make sure that it stays nice and tight. Last up, we have the knee pad here. This actually came with a much thicker strap, this one right here, but I replaced it with this half inch strip. It's just sewn at the back so that it doesn't come apart and it's about big enough to fit my arm through. Now this needs to be modified a little bit before we could put it into the thing. We need to cut a recess for the button here and we also need to cut some slants in here so that these EVA foam parts can be fit. The last thing we have to do here is glue down the knee pad, but we only want to glue down the top half so that this bottom half can still fold up and you can have access to these Velcro straps here. So as it turns out, doing this on camera makes me a little less precise with my cuts. Uh, this was the one I did first off camera. It lines up better with the EVA foam here. So if you're looking for a guide, definitely follow this one. Uh, with the shoulders done here, we can move on to the upper arms. Okay, so here's our upper arm pieces. Uh, the first problem I ran into was which one of these pieces goes with which, and then once I have a pair, which arm do they go on? And the answer to that is that there is a flat side and a curved side. The flat side faces away from your body, so we got to find the flat side that matches up on each of these. This is the front of the arm, and this part with the little tricep here is the back of the arm. So this is a flat part here, and if you look here, this piece here has a little bit of a curve going up. So this is the inside, and then this side here is flat, so this is the outside. So these two are actually both part of the same arm, which is the left arm, and they will fit together like this. As you can see, there's a lot of overlap here, so what I'm going to do is fit this to my arm, and then cut off the excess and join them. The goal here is to have a, a part with no seam, so that these two pieces kind of become one piece. So at this point there is still a lot of overlap, so I made some safe markings and did a preliminary dremeling of each piece. Okay, so here we are at, with the upper arms after the initial cuts. They're starting to get much more normally sized, like an arm could actually fit in there. I think they're still a little bit big, so I'm going to do a couple more test fits and maybe trim a little bit. Uh, I'm going to start worrying about lining up these edges a little bit better so that they, they meet a little more flush. I can always fill them in later, but the closer I can get them with the cuts, the better. I started using some blue painter's tape to tack the pieces into place for the test fits. Uh, at this point, it was just test fitting, then taking it outside to Dremel, fit, trim, fit, trim, until I had the pieces where I needed them. 
Now it's time for assembly, and this is where I go a little off the beaten path. The typical method is to use the pieces you dremeled off as shims to attach the two halves together, but I take a slightly different approach. I 3D printed these thin ABS strips using my Lulzbot Moore Struder, which was able to print these over a millimeter thick on a single layer, which makes it go really fast. I had a roll of white ABS that was going bad, so I printed the whole roll, leaving me with dozens of these little strips to use as flexible shims. And since the shims and the armor are both made from ABS plastic, we can chemically weld them together using acetone. Remember those uniform chips I collected while I trimmed the parts? Well these are mixed with the acetone to make an ABS slurry which acts as a type of glue that literally welds the parts together using a chemical reaction instead of heat. The trick is how you mix it, or rather how you don't mix it. Let a big thick blob of ABS collect at the bottom of the jar and keep the top a really thin mix. This gives you a gloppy glue to hold down the shims and a thin liquid that'll get pulled into all of the gaps with capillary action. The connection is super durable, and it's basically how my entire BB-8 build stays together, so holding these parts together will be a breeze. Another great part about these shims is they are easily cut to fit with a pair of scissors. This is great for maximizing surface area to glue onto. I start by applying the slurry to both the armor piece and the shim, and then clamping them into place. The work time with this slurry is pretty forgiving, but it tacks itself into place rather quickly so you can keep on working. I attach two shims at each joint, and then go in with some of the thinner liquid to seal everything up while the main glop is clamped into place. I test fit the other half of the shim and trim it so it fits perfectly into the other armor part and then repeat the process at the other joint. With both sides dried and ready, I apply glue to two tabs and then the matching armor spots. I tack that into place and then immediately do the other side. It's important to glue both sides at the same time because these two sides will be pulling on each other and doing one before the other may result in some wonky joints or curvature. I join the pieces together, clamp them down and make some manual adjustments to make sure the two pieces are matching as much as possible. Right off the bat, I start gap filling and reinforcing with a slurry. Most of our gap filling will be done later with some Bondo, but this slurry will give a great substrate for that to grab onto. With both pieces assembled, we can begin sanding and filling. This will be a little bit more intensive than it was with the shoulders, but the same idea applies. Fill the low spots, sand the high spots until everything meets. When everything was flush, I followed the same basic paint procedure as with the shoulders, but obviously stopped at the white. This takes care of the painting portion, but before we can weather, there is one more assembly that needs to be added. Commander Bao has three small ammo boxes on his arm attached to a gray belt. Finding a thin gray belt is harder than you might think, so I ended up buying a white one. I cut the appropriate length of belt and an extra dummy piece to do some tests with. I'm going to attempt to dye it using this RIT black dye. I used this on my chopper tire and found that before things turn out black, they turn a little purple, so hopefully I can get a gray that is pretty desaturated. I got a pot of water to a near boiling point and placed the belt in. I did the tester piece at 4 minutes and thought it came out a little too dark, so I did the second piece at 2 minutes and I think this result is pretty great actually. I also printed 3 ammo boxes and finished them to the same white paint scheme. With all the pieces ready, I began by gluing my belt into place with some super glue. For this I am using Bob Smith Industries CLA, the purple stuff. I lined up the seam to land just behind where one of the boxes is going to be in hopes of totally hiding it. I planned ahead a little bit on the mounting of these boxes and printed them with these mounting holes in the back. I also printed out a guide box with the same holes going straight through. This way I could mark the drill holes as I lined up the boxes, however, in all my genius I made the holes for the boxes too far apart to fit on the belt, so rather I drilled a third hole in the middle and will secure the boxes with a single screw through the middle of the belt. One by one I lined up the boxes, used the guide holes to make a scuff on the belt, drilled through and screwed the box in from the other side. With this assembly complete, we can start to weather the upper arms. Unlike the shoulders here, we are going to be doing our weathering directly on white paint, so this will show my general weathering method a little better. The first goal of weathering is vignetting all the parts. I want there to be a gradient going from perfectly clean at the center of any surface to a light to medium gray at the edges. I achieved this first with light washes. Using some black acrylic paint, I use a really watery mix to stain the part, focusing heavily on the edges and extremely light in the middle. I tend to wipe off 90% of what I lay down each time and let that other 10% accumulate layer after layer until I have the look that I want. I also mix in a lot of dry brush work here to accentuate the edges. Just like with the white, you shouldn't be getting too much cover on any one pass, let it build up naturally. It's really easy to overdo it with weathering, so take your time. You may notice I removed my ammo boxes for this stage, this way I can do some weathering behind it as well for some realistic look. Once I have a nice dirty edged part, I can add the boxes back in and start manually painting in some scratches. 
This is kind of where you have to commit to making some heavy lines. In person, it will look too dark, and I usually have a nervous sweat as I paint on these thick, dark lines, and I always think it looks terrible as I'm doing it. But you'll notice from a few feet away or in pictures, it looks really nice. I tend to make a lot of marks, wipe most of it away, and then paint on the remnant, and then I wipe that away, and so on and so on, until the mark looks a little more organic than just a brush stroke. When all my line painting is done, I add in some more vignetting with an airbrush to add contrast and make the center of each surface really pop. With my painting done, I spray everything down with a matte clear coat to seal it all up. Now I may add some internal padding later to make things fit a little better, but I think this is going to be fine for now. So the only thing that we have to do as far as padding installation and all of that is to add this single strip of the carpet side of some industrial Velcro. Now we can take this Y strap that I have here, attach it to the two Velcro pieces in the shoulder, and then the bottom part attaches to the upper arm and that'll hold together this whole assembly. Now we can keep moving down the arm and work on the elbows. All right, here's all the parts we're gonna be working with for the elbow. We have the armor piece from Imperial Surplus. This is the foam insert kit that you can add on from Imperial Surplus. It's really handy, you should definitely get these. This is part of a silicone strap kit that I got from Dino over at Sanitized Creations. And this is a, the strap from the shoulder pad that we took out. So we have the armor, we have the cosmetic strap, and we have the structural strap here. The cool thing about this foam kit is that when you put it into the armor, it kind of gives you an outline to trim your piece around. So there's not a lot of guesswork on how to trim your elbow piece. You just kind of follow the guides of the foam piece, which is awesome. You also have to cut out these little vent holes here. What I did is I just drilled through them and then used a file to kind of file them out. It's pretty simple. The main construction of this is going to look like this. So we're going to have the, I'll take this out for now, we're going to have the structural strap which is actually going to go around my arm pinned behind the foam and then on top of that we're going to put the cosmetic strap. So the problem with this setup if you notice when I pull the strap tight it pulls the tops of the foam inserts in and off of the armor piece. Over time this is going to be more and more of a problem so I'm going to cut some slits into the foam to allow the elastic to come through before it gets to the thinner side pieces. I draw an outline of the strap and then I make a mark where I wanted to enter the interior of the foam. I drilled through and cut out the slit. This will allow the elastic to pull only the thick base of the part where there isn't a lot of movement. Problem solved. Before we can assemble, we need to lay down our white paint. So I did my usual finish and paint process for the armor pieces. The foam kit kind of comes in this nasty looking yellow, so I'm going to coat that as well with some SEM vinyl coat in Carver White. This is going to flake off the foam like crazy, but it's better than nothing and at least will give a good indication of white rather than yellow. And now that everything is in white, we can start assembling. The first thing that we're going to do is glue down our cosmetic strap. So the strap is silicone and then it has this webbing molded inside of it. So if we put it here, the silicone is actually a little bit thicker than the part itself. So you're going to have this overhang here. Now that's all well and good, but there's an easy way to make that flush. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut a notch into the silicone just to down to the webbing part and we're going to leave the webbing exposed. Then I'm going to take an ABS shim, which is about half the thickness of that silicone, and put it right on top of the strap there. I'm going to super glue it down to the webbing. Then that will fill that space and make the top of the silicone flush with the edge of the part. So since it's ABS, we can do the same solvent welding we've been doing and make a nice tight shim right at the edge of this part. And we'll have the silicone being flush with the edge of the armor and it'll look really nice. I did the same procedure with the other side, and while all that is drying, we can prep the foam to be inserted into the armor piece. So now on the foam padding side of things, we have to cut a recess here to make room for that strap that we just glued down. So I take my X-Acto blade and just cut out a little chunk as cleanly as I can. It doesn't really matter how clean it is because you're not going to see this anyway. While I'm at it, I'm going to hack off these tabs here. I'm not really sure if they're supposed to be there. I was going to keep them just for good measure, but as I put them on, they're definitely uncomfortable, so I'm just going to get rid of those also. It doesn't really matter that you can see the yellow coming through because this is all going to be covered with the strap anyway. Now we can complete the assembly. After getting our structural strap installed into the new slots, we can insert the entire foam piece into the armor. Once everything is fitted and all the straps are fitting into their recesses, we can glue it all down. I only glued at the top. Uh, I can't imagine I would need more than that to hold the foam in place. Now we can start weathering everything. This is going to be the same procedure as before with the armor part, washes, and hand painting and airbrushing.
The only big difference here is we are also going to weather the foam pads. You can see them quite a bit on the final build, especially at the bottom, and some perfectly clean padding might look a little strange compared to everything else, so I'll get that weathered in there as well. Then I hit the whole thing with the matte clear coat as usual, and we are done with the elbows. The forearms aren't too unlike the upper arms. They are two pieces that overlap quite a bit and need to be trimmed out to fit. Unlike the upper arms, there isn't a right or a left forearm. Each arm is identical in the beginning, and what eventually makes them unique is the addition of the compad. Each clone is fitted with a compad that sits on his right forearm, and this is one of the greeblies that I have been dreading in this build. The Imperial Surplus Armor Kit comes with this hard resin compad, which from what I hear is a bit of a pain to make sit on the non-flat top of the forearm. Some people heat it and bend it, some people build it up from the sides. I decided to forego all of that and just print my own in a flexible material. I didn't copy the Imperial Surplus design, I just went with a more geometric boxy one without the little antenna indication on the right. I might follow this video up with a vlog video about why, because it's actually a mildly interesting story why I chose to go this route. Anyway, the flex material wrapped pretty nicely around the bend, and I finished off all of the pre-paint work with the compad in place. After painting on the white, I had to do a little masking. There's actually some blue stripes at the bottom of each of the forearms, which is outlined in the CRL. I didn't do the uh, latex on this blue. I thought the big paint chipping would look a little too deliberate for this tiny little piece, and I thought I can get the same effect by just using some sandpaper and some scratches. So I painted on the blue, and then it was all about using the sandpaper and scuffing the blue and putting some black paint on top to get the look that I wanted. In the end, I think this came out pretty good, and I think this is how I'm going to do all of the smaller blue sections from here on out, and I'm going to reserve the latex chipping for some of the larger blue sections. With the forearms all finished, we can move on to the last part, the hands, which at this point is a bit of a layup. Just like the shoulders, they require no real assembly and are the smallest parts, so getting them trimmed and painted is easier than anything else we've done to this point. The only tricky part comes in attaching them to the body. I bought these gloves. They are tactical pilot fire resistant fight gloves, which sounds like every possible buzzword used to attract bros, but they're super cool. I also printed out these little hand adapters out of ABS. They have four prongs extending off the base, which slope to meet the inside faces of the hand armor. I place the adapter into the glove on top of my hand and line up the hand armor where it needs to go. I then cut an X shape on top of each of the prongs to let them poke through the glove. Now we have four ABS prongs sticking out of the glove, so we grab our trusty ABS slurry and use it to glue down the hand armor right into its correct position. This is a real quick process and both hands are now ready for action. Alright, it's time to try all this stuff on for the first time. I am officially wearing my clone undersuit. I forgot to mention this throughout the video, but when you're testing the size of parts, and testing the fit you should always be wearing the clone undersuit so you know how it's going to fit but now let's officially try on some of this armor all right gonna start with the shoulder upper arm assembly okay so here's that arm uh, eventually there's going to be the strap that goes from the shoulder to the strap that's going to come around here and that's going to hold this shoulder up right now it tends to droop down as i move around because there's nothing supporting it but that should change once i get that strap installed now for the other arm All right, both shoulders are on. Let's move on to the elbows. You always want to put them on with the vents facing out. Okay, elbows are on, shoulders are on. So far we have some pretty good mobility here. I can still probably get my helmet on. Things feeling good. Now we're gonna put the forearms on. All right, arms up to the forearms are good. Now the last piece is the gloves. Now as I put the gloves on, I'm gonna to try to tuck them into the bottom of the forearm so that there's no noticeable seam here. This is a lot easier to do with my ungloved hand. We'll see how easily the next glove goes into the forearm. Definitely a bit trickier on this arm. All right, arms are on. Feels good, definitely have some good mobility. Uh, where's my gun? DC-15 in hand here. Let's put the helmet on. All right, everything's put on, everything feels good. I feel like I have some good mobility. I can move my arms around quite a bit, which is nice, they feel good. These shoulders are definitely drooping down on me, but other than that, I'm pretty happy with how everything's fitting. So this is great.
So I think that's going to do it for this video. We got the arms all set up and on. This is awesome. It was a pretty long video, but hopefully next time we don't have to go through all of the trimming and the painting stuff. We can focus more on what makes each part unique. Uh, if you remember from my helmet portion of this series, if you were following along, we end every episode with a progression shot. I think I'm going to start a new progression, otherwise by the end that'll be a pretty long banjo lick running over and over again. So let's start a new progression, and I will see you guys next time.